Hello, everyone. Hi, my name is Carrie Ryan. I'm the lead curator for learning and interpretation at M Plus, and I'm delighted to welcome you here to our talk, Beyond the Polka Dot, um, with our guests um, who will be joining us in a minute. Um, before I get there, I just want to double check on a few housekeeping items. The first one is that we are doing simultaneous interpretation. So if you need a headset, now is your chance to go and get one um, from the front. We have a, just a minute or so before we'll get started. Um, we are also doing our Q&A through Slido, which is a web app. So you can use this QR code um, to access the platform, and then you can key in the questions you have while you're watching um, the talk today. Um, and we'll get to the Q&A at the end of our presentation. And just a note, at the end of the um, talk today, if you have a admission or a special exhibition ticket, you can exit through the top and enter into the gallery. If you do not, you can leave through the bottom of the stairs. You can always purchase one if you want to go to the show um, after you've heard the talk today. So um, with that, I'd love to get started. So I will introduce our two, our three um, guests today. We have uh, so Sohania Rafael, the museum director, who will be moderating our talk today, Dorian Chong, deputy director and chief curator, and our um, guest curator, Mika Yoshitake. And I'd like you all to welcome them here this morning. Good afternoon. It's very nice to be here at this point in our, in our day, which is our first anniversary of the museum's opening. I can't believe that it's been a year and two million people later. So thank you all for supporting M Plus, because without you, our work does not have the sense that we need it to be. All of us do this because we have a dialogue with all of you, and the work we do is about making meaning of that dialogue. It's very important for us to also think about what did we consider for our first anniversary as a special exhibition, our birthday present, as it were, and our birthday present to all of us, to each other. On our first year for M+, it felt so natural that we asked one of the most eminent, respected, extraordinarily visionary artists from our region to celebrate with us. Yayo Kusama, she is 93 years old and is heralds really a shepherding figure, a figure that really makes us think about what it means to be a creative human being in the world today, a human being who is also full of courage thoughtfulness, insight, and joy amidst a huge life that we will now explore together with our to two co-curators who've brought insight and incredible new scholarship to the table. This is a definitive exhibition of Kusama. It starts from 1945, when she was only 16, right through to now, this summer. Very, very new work. Um, things that have never left Japan before have been made possible for us to show. And that's because we have two of the great, greatest curators, really. Um, from um, One from our museum, Deputy Director and Chief Curator, Dorian Chung, and Mika Yoshitake, who is an independent curator and is the scholar for uh, uh, Japanese artists post-war and, and Kusama herself. So it's, um, it's, it's really important that we work with, we, that we bring excellence for our city in Hong Kong, but also to lead Hong Kong into the future um, in relation to cultural content. So my first questions to our co-curators, what are the differences between this exhibition and the many retrospectives that Kusama has had, and what makes this exhibition particularly relevant here in Asia and in Hong Kong? Thank you for that, Suanya. Um, that is actually a question I think we have been asked quite a lot already by various journalists as well as the stakeholders and general public. Why Kusama again? Because she's had so many exhibitions all around the world. The first thing that I always say to that is that given 
the longevity and the visibility and res uh, respect and admiration that she commands around the world, I actually feel that she hasn't had enough, especially the ones that go deep enough to reveal um, how uh, profound, actually, her artistic practice as well as a philosophy are at the foundational level. Um, so that's what we uh, set for our own mission for this exhibition. Um, but of course, that's not to disregard everything that, that our predecessors or our, our, our colleagues have already done at different institutions. Um, there was a major exhibition, uh, European and American tour that was organized by Tate Modern that was 10 years ago already. Um, there were a couple of retrospectives that were done in Japan at the National Art Center a few years ago, also at the National Art Gallery of Singapore a few years ago. How this particular exhibition departs from those predecessors is that, that we decided to take on um, a, thematic, a thematic approach. Previous exhibitions were, were almost universally chronological. Um, and not necessarily paying even attention throughout the periods and decades. So what we decided to do, and so what I'm showing here, is the map of how the exhibition is organized and divided. In the West Gallery, where the, the majority of the exhibition is, you can see those uh, six numbered themes, as well as a little introduction and interludes. Um, and then also we have at the B2 level, um, as part of the ticketed exhibition, two brand new works that Kusama made a site specifically for the museum, and also the third work that is available for everybody who walks into the ground floor. Um, so I think it will be useful to walk through what those themes are, um, and I will ask Mika to do that. Thanks, Dorian. Thanks, Sohanya. So we have organized this show into six themes, and each of these themes recur throughout her long 75-year career. Um, there are two familiar themes. One is infinity, and this is really the basis of her most established work, which was first produced in New York in 1958, where she lived uh, for 15 years. And this expansive net pattern, which is really the form of these interconnected dots, or arcs, sorry, um, were inspired by the sea currents of the Pacific Ocean, um, over which she flew from Japan to the United States in 1957. And over the years, these, this motif has really evolved into sublime and ephemeral forms, like rain, clouds, um, even this Buddhist cycle of transmigration in response to natural disaster. Accumulation is really the sculptural form of the infinity net motif that she began in 1962. And these are hundreds of these stuffed and sewn phallic tubers that she attaches to domestic furniture, like dining tables, chairs, sofas, um, high-heeled shoes, and she called them accumulations, um, which, you know, she literally obfuscated the use value of the function of these, um, these domestic objects and um, through the uniformity of white paint, which she then develops through various um, fabric patterns as well as metallic paint. Um, and in these very densely packed shows, which she would also call obsessional art, um, food or sex compulsions. She, Kusama explore, explored the, repulsive, the repulsions and also the attraction to society's obsession with food and sex during the countercultural revolution and the capitalist culture of overconsumption. Radical connectivity is our third section, which um, really is this desire for interconnection or in interconnectivity of life that uh, became politicized during the late 1960s um, in the Vietnam War era. And here we introduce Kusama's philosophy of self-obliteration, which called for the emptying of one's ego in, um, and really commu uh, communal healing. Um, and she, would do, she was very notorious for her happenings where there were, she would gather um, you know, uh, performers in nude and paint polka dots on each other. And it was this really uh, radical form of bringing um, people who were 
on the margins of life as well together. And also, um, you know, it was also her response against um, discrimination and um, again, you know, amongst people, especially during war. Um, and really a call for um, of love and um, community. And this radical connectivity theme really does um, expand through the infinity mirror rooms um, as well up to the present. The biocosmic is also another theme that is unique to this exhibition. Um, since the very beginning, Kusama you know, grew up in her uh, family seed nursery. And um, so she was very um, observant of these plant anatomies, which she saw um, kind of also as a form of um, a cosmic universe and the orderliness of the universe. And so the polka dot really is the form of this, a source of life, like the sun, as well as the moon, and an interconnection between them um, is a form of, you know, um, of life for her. And in this section, we see from the very beginning during the war period, um, some of these paintings that she actually made out of seed uh, jute bags um, when canvas was very scarce. Um, so you can see her resourcefulness um, all the way up to um, the, the 80s where she created these almost monstrous plant um, sculptural forms, um, these psychosexual sculptures, as well as these assemblages, collages, and um, this new installation called Clouds, which is um, a highlight in the gallery where there's um, the beautiful light coming through the uh, architectural spaces. Oops. Uh, death is the fifth theme, um, and we see these, you know, also as kind of pairing. So infinity and accumulation, radical connectivity, and biocosmic, and then death, and then the last theme, which is the force of life. Death is a very profound subtext in throughout Kusama's career. She's been very open about her mental illness, um, which she suffered from since she was a child. Um, and you know the earliest work that is in this show is from 1945, from her wartime sketchbook. And this is, you know, it, it integrates with the the devastation that she experienced throughout the war, the atomic bomb, as well as the um, return after New York um, to Japan, which she was a very deep, dark um, period in her life, which we'll um, elaborate on uh, later today. And then the final um, section is called Force of Life, and it really contextualizes her most prolific series called My Eternal Soul. Um, she made over 900 paintings over the last decade, really, and um, so we have this kind of explosion of motifs that and palette um, that you see as a revival and the strength of her life. So these six themes a structure the main part of the exhibition in the West Gallery on the second floor, um, including almost uh, 200 work, over 200 works in fact. And as I was mentioning just a moment ago, that there are three brand new works that Kusama made for us for this exhibition and for the M plus building specifically. You would have passed by these uh, two lovely pumpkin sculptures, monumental size of sculptures, new forms also, elongated and extended forms of the pumpkin, just outside of this space, moving image center. And then we have death of nerves that fills the found space in the B2 level, as well as the light well, the three-story high void that connects the two basement spaces and the ground floor. Um, this is an update on the 1976 sculpture, which I think we will talk about a little bit more later. Um, a fairy tale like magical forest. Then we have the third work, Dot's Obsession, Aspiring to Heaven's Love, in the studio, in also in the B2 level, which is just, it's like walking in, inside a kaleidoscope um, of infinite reflections um, and merging inside and outside. So this, I hope, gives a sense of how we structure the exhibition, but also added incredible new attractions. Thank you, Dorian. So we also titled um, this talk that Dorian and Mika are sharing their insights about. Um, 
as beyond the polka dot. Who is Yayo Kusama? And we thought we would introduce to you, each, each one of us has worked with Kusama at, in different times in our career, and why that took place. So um, I worked with Kusama when I was working at the Queensland Art Gallery in Brisbane, and the first time I worked with her was in 19, uh, in 2002, an exhibition in 2002, but I met her in the late 90s. Um, and I was working on an exhibition called the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, which had been underway for the decade of the 90s. And the premise of that exhibition, which also included a very important collection development for that institution, was to look at very, very contemporary work made in the Asia Pacific, um, usually within three years of the date of that exhibition. And what became very apparent in Brisbane and in Australia was that there was a huge hunger for knowledge about art from this region, but an assumption that contemporary art just uh, from the Asia Pacific emerged in the 90s. So as a museum, we need to educate, and we know for a fact that that is not true. So the 2002 edition of the Asia Pacific Triennial was based around three very important international figures, uh, transnational figures as much as they are local figures, and they were Liu Fan, Namjoon Paik, and Yayo Kusama. And that exhibition then looked at four decades of practice of each of those four people and constellations of artists around them. So this is uh, my example of work for my first working with Kusama. I went to do a couple more exhibitions, but really it's Dorian and Mika who should tell us about the many exhibitions that they have made and how that has informed this show that we see today here. Well, so in my case, um, it is actually the first time that I am doing a Kusama exhibition. So one could say that it's a, you know, finally dream come true. <laughs> um, but I also feel like throughout my career that I have um, been around Kusama. Um, so one very significant exhibition um, in my career was this exhibition called Tokyo 1955 to 1970, A New Avant-Garde. And this was at MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, when I used to work there. And in fact, this was the last major project I did before moving to Hong Kong um, to work for M Plus, uh, to work on the M Plus project in 2013. So this exhibition was 2012. It was an expansive exhibition that really argues how this 15 year period following the decade after the end of World War II really marks Tokyo as one of the greatest epicenters of the avant-garde activities in post-war years. It included about 60 artists, photographers, also architects, and some designers. And I'm just showing you a couple of the installation views of this exhibition, and I hope that you kind of get a sense of the energy that, was, that we were trying to convey from that very fertile period. But 55 to 70 also more, more or less coincides with the time that Kusama wasn't in in Japan. She was mostly in New York. Um, but in the smaller image, upper right corner, in the far left, then you see these four little drawings. Those were Kusama drawings that we did include in, I did include in this exhibition, um, including these three that are in the Museum of Modern Art collection. So you can see here, especially the first two, actually all of them, but they are titled Infinity Nets and accumulation. And even though those breakthrough styles or motifs don't become uh, formally uh, you know, uh, started until late 50s and early 60s, as we will also talk about again, those ideas were already there, represented in small ways in these drawings. So I guess that was, without really knowing, that was kind of prefiguring what I was going to do later, 10 years later, working on this exhibition. So this exhibition was also important, not just for myself, but for the Museum of Modern Art, because um, Japan or Asia was kind of off the radar for this very important, well, arguably the most important museum that deals with modern, modern and contemporary art history. So 
On the left is the catalog for the exhibition, and Mika is one of the authors, so that was one of our earlier collaborations. And then on the right is an anthology of very important writings that came out of the period of post-war to postmodern that we published in during that time. I just have a couple more slides to contextualize further because it wouldn't be fair for me to say that my exhibition in 2012 was the first Japanese or Asian exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art. In fact, Japan played a quite a prominent role in the history of that museum already in the 60s. So here is a major exhibition of a survey of the new trends in painting and sculpture that came out of Japan that was organized already in 64. Um, so it was very uh, much uh, ahead of its time or forward looking, but it is also true that this was forgotten by the time that I came around and started working for the Museum of Modern Art as one of the, actually very few, I think I was maybe one of the two Asian curators in the whole museum at the time. And I also need to acknowledge that, that uh, in 1998, there was also a solo exhibition of Yayoi Kusama, which really helped to uh, rediscover her and bring her back onto not just New York and American, but international consciousness about the very important work that she did. And you see the dates in the title, 58 to 68, um, during the time that Kusama was living in New York. So this was a, something of a homecoming for her as well. And, and then, so I think of the work that I did at MoMA as the part of that legacy, the long history of that Western institution dealing with and engaging with Japanese and Asian art. So that experience is very important piece that informed our work, at least my work on this Kusama exhibition. So prior to this exhibition, I had worked on two Kusama um, exhibitions at museums in the US. The first is called Infinity Mirrors, which originated at the Hirschhorn Museum in Sculpture Garden, where I was a curator um, back until 2018. And the show actually traveled to five other museums um, in North America. And you can see Kusama here holding the book for the exhibition. Um, but the, w the way that this show happened was that um, there was a lot of uh, demand institutionally um, for an exhibition that would, you know, draw um, visitorship. And um, the director at the time wanted to really um, feature an Asian artist. Um, she was also an Asian specialist. Um, and so Kusama was, you know, chosen, but she really wanted to focus on the Infinity Mirror Rooms. My response to that was that I, I felt that it was important to contextualize, historicize, and present a more scholarly um, context because Infinity Mirror Rooms were very Instagrammable and they were very much um, within this kind of context of blockbuster exhibitions that I think, you know, um, didn't do justice to Kusama's um, career. And so um, what, I, what I had set myself to do is to really understand the philosophy behind these mirror rooms. And actually the first one was from 1965, you know, just when around the time that we were discussing the, um, the accumulation sculptures. So that is why you see um, in the Fallais field, which is the first um, mirror room here, a lot of those um, tubers that then she added polka dots to them. And in fact, um, when she first made them, it was really to um, rid herself of this, um, this kind of hallucina hallucination that she was having. Um, it was kind of like this wonderland of, um, of you know, these objects. Um, and she wanted to, to kind of materialize her vision. And the best way to do it, you know, her, so she was painting these infinity net um, mural sized paintings and then um, creating the phallic tubers, but mirrors were her kind of um, invention of how to 
create the endlessness and the boundlessness of her, um, this kind of horror, horror vacui, um, if you will. And so the, um, at the time she also started to make these um, hexagonal peep type murums. Um, this is called Love Forever. And you can see a mural of her inside the structure. I mean, they weren't that big. And so um, anyway, it was, we featured six of these mirror rooms in the exhibition, all very different types. Um, the Dots Obsession, which you see here um, at, at M Plus, is part of a whole series that she began in the 90s, um, which included a big dome structure inside um, an architectural space full of these kind of vinyl balloons. And so um, the idea behind these is really to integrate the macro and the micro. She also had a peep type um, dome, uh, which she always included to enhance that um, scale shift. Um, we also included back then what was the latest um, Infinity Mirror, which is all the eternal love I have for pumpkins. Um, which introduced the black glass and just kind of this extension of, you know, foray of, of pumpkins. Um, and the show traveled, I mean, it was, I think, the biggest, um, highest attendance for every museum. I think it really broke records and um, it was kind of overwhelming, you know, to, I went to every single museum. Um, it was an incredible tour, and um, and I think this is you know one of the reasons why Kusama is just one of the most sought after artists at every museum to kind of you know enhance her their um, status. The second exhibition was very different. Um, it was called Cosmic Nature, and this was staged at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, I was approached by the New York Botanical Garden to, um, because of my work with the Infinity Mirror Show, um, to develop uh, an exhibition that focused on Kusama's um, history of being, you know, um, grow growing up in a seed nursery and the development of the botanical imagery, um, which hadn't been done before, um, oddly enough. So I um, developed closely with the artist in the studio, um, some of the memories that she had. So the pumpkin here that you see, the starry pumpkin inside the conservatory, we recreated the scene of her, or the memory of her grandfather, you know, taking her through the fields and her discovering these very voluptuous, adorable, almost grotesque pumpkins, um, and seeing them as very cosmic. Um, so that's where the biocosmic theme actually comes in. And we also um, included a, a, a real life um, greenhouse um, with synthetic plants inside. Um, and each person was given a sticker, a flower sticker. And by the end of the exhibition, the inside was completely obliterated. So this is a version of the obliteration room, which you might know with the um, polka dots. Um, that uh, was that Suhanya first, um, yes, commissioned Kusama to do back in 2002 as part of the Asia Pacific Triennale. Um, so then we also have um, these site specific uh, sculptures that were, you know, um, installed within the grounds of the botanical garden. And um, it was also a very popular show. Um, and we also contextualized this work with um, indoor works as well. So of course, many of the, the, the themes of the buds and um, really come out of this exhibition. Which leads me to our exhibition and to ask the question, what about you know, when you were preparing this exhibition, maybe you can share some new insights, especially in relation to her philosophy and, um, you know, the cosmic thinking that she also brings to the table. It's, it's yeah, maybe you can share some of those ideas. Right. Um, I mean, both of us already knew quite a bit about Kusama. I mean, certainly, I mean, Mika, uh, being one of the world experts in Kusama's work, has known about her thinking, her writing, and her biography. Hello. 
Can you hear me? Still? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, very pro uh, profoundly already, but I think it was a kind of a journey of discovery for both of us, um, because as I was saying earlier, that we set as our mission to really demonstrate the depth and complexity of her philosophical, philosophical thinking at the foundation of her practice, that by doing so, we realized that that philosophy is very much enmeshed with her biography. So I think it will be actually useful to walk through the, uh, her biography step by step and see um, how that idea is, where did they originate and how um, should we turn to again and again, how she built on that thought, uh, that thinking. So the very beginning, um, here you see Kusama at 10 years old. You know, she, I mentioned that she grew up in a seed nursery. Um, her mother was the um, matriarch of the family. Her father was actually married into the family. So since the get-go, there was a lot of um, issues, tra uh, family trauma. And this is um, a portrait that you see with um, her chrysanthemums, um, peonies, <laughs> dahlias, sorry. <laughs> dahlias. Um, very, oh, they almost look larger than her their, her face. Um, and the drawing to the right is actually um, the same age, around 10 years old. Um, and you can see the first instance of the polka dots that um, she began to see in her hallucinations. And this is something she suffered um, from throughout her life. And sometimes it is actually a motivating a factor for her w artwork. But really, um, she felt like she was a prisoner inside her own body. And, um, you know, of course, this was a time of the war. And uh, she experienced the destruction that was happening and the scarcity of food. Um, and so the drawing, the first drawing, um, the earliest drawing in the exhibition is from 1945. These are dead leaves of corn. Um, and it, but it has this almost um, kind of aurora-like you know, um, quality to it. So you can see her mystic vision coming through. Um, she was she was trained in Nihonga, which is Japanese style painting, and so there is this very self -disci um, d disciplinary kind of um, training that she creates with nature, which was a source of rebirth for a lot of artists um, experiencing the war. Um, but for her, Kusama, she really uh, was drawn towards surrealism. And, um, you know, a away from the kind of social realist and existential um, um, philosophies that were more bound at the time. And these kind of chance effects um, really um, dictated some of the ways in which she worked her techniques. She was very experimental. Um, but these early paintings really speak to that um, horrific um, experience. She was also conscript conscripted to um, sew uniforms and parachutes during the war. So that is the experience she has with you know her later work with the accumulation sculptures. Those very stuffed and sewn, um, those thousands of, of um, sculptures that she really um, develops into these massive um, environmental works. Um, and then when she starts making the infinity net paintings, she really shifts her practice away from those more surrealist um, drawings and paintings into a much more abstract um, canvas. And she's reacting against the very white male abstract expressionist um, context in, the New in New York. These are um, much more subdued, but um, she begins with a very dark um, base and then um, creates a very textured arc that continues on in, for, in terms of this kind of boundless almost, um, where, where the body, when one is standing in front of these paintings, you really experience, um, you have to really look closely. And this look, this, these paintings really feel like they can go on um, in an endless way. Um, the scale also can be very small, can be very far. Um, and so she starts to create these, these um, 
sculptures as well, um, responding again to the um, culture of consumption. Um, she was actually grouped together in an exhibition with Andy Warhol as well as Klaus Oldenburg um, in, at the Green Gallery in 1962 where you see the accumulation sculpture of um, the sofa piece. Um, but, you know, she was never picked up by that gallerist or um, Leo Castelli, who she really wanted to show with. Um, and so she really struggled, in fact, um, to sustain her career um, in New York. And she started to expand again, making her um, accumulations into these massive expanded um, mirror rooms. Um, she was invited to be part of these exhibitions. There's this poster here of an unrealized exhibition in um, in the Netherlands, where she was um, really part of the German Zero and Dutch Null groups. Um, one of the only Japanese um, and artists from the US to be part of these more immaterial um, experiments that were very radical and avant-garde at the time. These um, artists were, were dreaming of making works on the sea or in the air, um, and the mirror rooms are really part of that um, context. And she also did these guerrilla um, performances. This was at the Venice Biennale in 1966, where actually Lu Lucio Fontana, um, the famous Italian artist, helped to fund um, make 1,500 silver balls, um, which she um, placed outside the Biennale on the Giardini, the, gar the gardens, and there was a big sign that said, your narcissism for sale, and she was selling these each for two dollars us um as a commentary against you know this kind of um the the pop art you know um selling for so much money and she wanted to um promote more democratization of art um she was also wearing a, gr a gold kimono to uh, very self-conscious to kind of self-orientalize and um, sell, you know, herself as this like Asian woman. Um, very smart. So I'm going to um, hand it over to Dorian to continue. Yeah. So, I mean, there are no doubt some people in the uh, the audience um, who uh, have heard about or even familiar with uh, the career trajectory that we just described so far. Um, those years in New York that she spent from 1958 to 1973, 15 years from age 29 or so to 44, um, is now iconic story in art history. Um, but what we really wanted to do in this exhibition is that those breakthrough ideas and forms that she created, such as infinity and accumulation, are the ideas that she returned to again and again and continued to develop throughout her career, but also put a lot of highlight on the what we call middle period and later period of her life and career, because that 58 to 73, New York, it is so glorified in many ways now that that you know for 93 years a uh, three-year-old artist it's as if the last 50 years is almost just a postscript to those glory days in new york we're showing you this image this is uh, a one of the most iconic works that we are very lucky to have in the M Plus collection. It is part of the exhibition um, called Self Obliteration, which is a title and the idea that has already come up a couple of times. Um, it really expresses that quite radical philosophy of how you can dissolve the boundaries of the selves, emptying your own egos so that we can all be infinitely connected to each other radically egalitarian kind of philosophy. And she expresses that in this example, by having all of the mannequins and the dining furniture and whatever is the objects that are on the dining table, covering them completely with the infinity net. So they're all part of the, this unity, um, in fact. And, and then it's also an important work to show in the transition between New York to Tokyo. 
Um, you can see the date um, in this work, which is 1966 to 74. So she started the work in New York and then decided to bring it back to Tokyo. And we know that when she returned around 1973, it was not an easy time in her life. She was emotionally devastated, financially strapped, um, and part of that reason is that image that you see, Joseph Cornell, um, a very important American artist. Um, and Kusama and Cornell had very intense, long, uh, platonic relationship. And Cornell passed away in 72, which was an utter devastation for Kusama. Um, you see the image uh, of Kusama working in 76, and this is really at the height, or at the depth, I should say, of her depression. Um, her father also passes away in 74, someone that he, she had this intense love and hate relationship with all her life. Um, so that really the mid to late 1970s, and by the way, 1977 is that she famously checked herself into the psychiatric ward voluntarily, um, where she continues to live. So like, it's a really, you could say, the darkest period of her life. But it's also the period of reinvention. That's when she starts writing a lot more. Here you see the cover of her first novel, Manhattan Suicide Attic, which immediately received critical acclaims. And she continues to write. Um, so this is another work that is in the exhibition, in the death section of the exhibition, called Death of a Nerve. 76, again, in the deep uh, depression. But she continues to make the work. And, and I think she is really the living embodiment and testament to the power of art to, to heal, um, to renew the will to live. In the 80s, I think maybe you can think of it as a period of rehabilitation in terms of profession, professionally speaking. She was able to do a series of exhibitions, solo exhibitions in Japan, gaining more and more critical acclaims. And that led to this very recognizable body of work, such as these polka-dotted pumpkins. Um, and that led to so one of the, uh, the triumphant moments of return, uh, when she was selected to represent her country in Venice Biennale, uh, the most important recurring exhibitions of contemporary art in 1993. And that pumpkin sculpture that you see in 1994 um, is the first one, public one, um, in the Naoshima Island in Japan. And then it just continues. Um, her various collaborations, including Louis Vuitton, and opening her own museum in Tokyo in 2017. And then, um, as Mika touched upon earlier, um, in the just last 20, 15 to 20 years, she has been ever more productive than before um, and really continuing to paint. It's, um, it's great to see that trajectory and you realize the kind of peaks and troughs of an artist's life. This is not uncommon, um, but the persistence of vision, the courage with which she undertakes this work, and in many ways the art makes her as much as she makes the art. Um, and that kind of leads to um, how you've approached discussing her mental illnesses and how you thought you would expand that because it's such an important part of her, who she is and informs the practice. It would be great for you to share how you decided to frame that. Right. I mean, it's a well-known fact that the, she has a struggle. She has a, many struggles um, with her uh, uh, mental health. And, and, but what is really remarkable about, um, about that is, uh, is that, that she's been so bravely open and honest about it. And of course, especially after the pandemic, we are used to talking about our mental health. I think there has been cultural shift that it's no longer taboo. Um, but when she was making these works, for instance, the, the very first work that you see here called Accumulation of the Corpses, which is clearly a response to the utter destruction and devastation of World War II that Japan experienced 
but you see that the title continues to say prisoner surrounded by the curtain of depersonalization, depersonalization being one of the uh, official diagnoses of a number of um, psychological ailments that, that she has experienced. So back in 1950, for a young woman who's barely 20, 20 years old, to make work and actually reveal the vulnerability is an, a, a risk, uh, but then she really embraced that. So what we decided to do in this exhibition is to open the whole exhibition. We have an introduction, which we just call self-portraits. Just about a dozen self-portraits she has made from 1950 to 2020, 70 years span. And here are two examples, the very first one from 1950, and then the, uh, about uh, more than almost 30 years later, the one from 1978. And by looking at this, you can immediately tell that these are no ordinary self-portraits. Um, she is depicting herself in various ways. So as she really experiences peaks and valleys of her eventful life, then she continues to really um, examine and excavate her soul and put figurative mirror in front of her. And then the reflections that, sh that she sees are not normal faces, that are not typical faces. Um, and again, just talking about these, um, uh, we already talked about death of a nerve. Um, and in the really deepest points in her life, she just continues to work. You know, she continues to uh, engage her in intense manual labor as well as intellectual labor, and I think that's how she really uh, renews her will to live. Yeah, Doreen mentioned the depersonalization, which really is this kind of curtain or veil that um, she experiences between herself, her emotions, and um, against the rest of the world. And so the prisoner's door, which you see on the right, is um, very much part of this, um, this, you know, immerse this this quality of being um, trapped or almost um, feeling inside of herself, imprisoned of herself. Um, and this, these gnarling branches are the kind of the almost you know um, the synapses that perhaps are happening throughout this experience that she's feeling. Uh, one of the other parts of this show that's extraordinary to be thinking about in the 21st century of social media is how her work anticipates what social media could be, the popularity of it, the um, efficiency with which it, it, uh, it's kind of like an accumulation in itself, and how inst the Instagrammable world and the cult of television and media, how she manipulates that. Maybe that's also something that you reveal. So since the very beginning, Kusama has been very aware of staging herself and showing herself and disseminating her ideas and vision. Um, and the way she's done it is through photography. And she's always commissioned photographers to um, photograph herself. The first that you see here on the left is by a uh, photographer named Kenneth Van Sickle, um, who famously took many uh, photographs um, in New York in 1959. And here, the infinity net painting is montaged over her. And so the, I was just speaking about the, the veil, but it is this um, sort of veil that she um, communicates you know, through the her painting itself and through her. She also um, would take photographs of her studio with thousands of, you know, the phallic tubers with, surrounding the um, chairs and the boats. And, and after they would take a photo, she would stage a photograph, she would then paint um, to polka dots over it or cut other photographs of these uh, accumulation sculptures and create more densely packed um, collages. So they were these kind of, you know, endless collaging of her work and herself. She always had a wall of all of her work and herself um, 
And this this photograph here on the right is um, a, a kind of I know collage of or uh, integration of all of these um, exhibitions, posters, photographs of herself, um, even in newsletters, um, newspapers. And she was very keen on having herself. Um, and so through these performances she did around the um, beginning in the uh, mid to late 60s, um, she had herself photographed on one of the panels from the, the Fallais Field, Infinity Mirror Room. Um, she lies on a bed uh, on 14th Street in New York and she has it photographed by a famous photographer named Eiko Hosoe. Um, who used a fish eye lens to create this kind of radial pattern, um, which is kind of like that hallucination um, that she experiences. Um, and then she also had her own newsletter called Ukusamo Orji, uh, so this like tabloid, uh, which we have a copy of in the exhibition. And you can see her, um, you know, front and center. And then on the right, she actually did a performance at MoMA, um, in 1969 called The Grand Orgy to Awaken the Dead, um, where she had performers, um, you know, going inside the, 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 and kind of, you know, um, performing with the, the nude sculptures. And she wanted to, to make a statement about how, you know, MoMA needs to really um, modernize and activate um, instead of having these old, you know, French sculptures like Mayol. Um, and so she had these performers, um, you know, and then of course it made the front page of the Daily News. So that's kind of her early um, selfie or, you know, ways that she really anticipated this culture of social media. So from here we go to, um you know, the, one of the pleasures of Kusama and making this exhibition is how she's communicated with us. And I know she would send messages to the curators throughout the making of this exhibition. And when we finally opened the exhibition, she sent us all a message. And I, I, I felt it was really important that we share this message. So this is what she sent us to everyone at M+. It gives me great pleasure to present this exhibition as we commemorate the first anniversary of M+. I have always cried out to everyone, love forever. My constant and heartfelt prayer is that the people of this world will forge a path through and beyond the quagmire of war and terror, hatred and sorrow. I seek to benefit society with the foundation stone that is my wholehearted pursuit of truth in art. Today too, with every fiber of my being, I continue the fight. Today and tomorrow, I want to keep on living. Let us all join together in singing our hearts out for the cosmos in praise of humanity. Yayoi Kusama, October 2022. And with that, I thought we should now open up to questions because this, in many ways, is a message of such hope, of healing, at a time when we are, I feel, optimistic about coming out of pandemic, but also at a time when the world is at a crossroads. And yet, we have an artist, a very senior, important artist, a visionary artist of our time, giving us a message of hope and healing. And, you know, love forever is a great, um, great cry of support for humanity's possibilities. So with that, the Slido is there to ask questions of us. We have, um, I think, 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to take questions. Um, so, let's see. The first question, how much did the pandemic impact the development of the exhibition, both how you worked and in the messaging? Very good question. Well, I think we really just had to adapt to how 
all of us in the museum business, and but also in other industries, had to shift our practice, which is uh, that the physical meetings and the travels to various places, um, we obviously weren't able to do. I mean, I certainly wasn't able to do living in Hong Kong. Mika was able to do a little bit more because the US is much bigger than Hong Kong. Um, so at least the, the work that can be done in the US were done. Um, in a typical situation, Mika is the co-curator and especially this museum being built and prepared uh, for the first time that it would have been important for Mika to come here and actually experience and have physical workshops together here. We had to do all of that remotely and virtually, but that's just how things um, had to be done during in the middle of the pandemic. I think what's also important is that we had to rely on our colleagues a lot, um, the kinds of things that they would typically do, such as visiting different public collections or private collections to inspect the artworks that they, we intend to loan. We had to rely on our colleagues. And ever more than any other exhibitions, probably, we really had to work very closely with the dedicated staff um, in the artist studio. They were really absolutely essential in realizing this exhibition. A um, couple of other questions that I can condense together, which is about um, Kusama is a world-recognized superstar now, but this wasn't always the case. When did she become famous? And then there was another question about cultural icon. You know, How do you think Kusama became a cultural icon? These are connected. And it's interesting question because she moves from being an artist into being something quite different and quite interesting to understand what that might mean. Well, um, you know, becoming a cultural icon, I mean, it was a very, very long road for her, journey for her. And as we discussed, you know, she went into a very deep depression in the 70s and she actually turned towards writing. And in fact, she is um, has received many awards in the literary field too. So that was one way that she became um, well known within Japan. Um, but it really wasn't until the 90s when um, she represented Japan at the 1993 biennial um, and then towards the late 90s when um, MoMA and LACMA actually organized the first uh, big exhibition which only focused on the New York years, really, 10 years. Um, uh, that she began to have more um, major recognition. She did have a retrospective in 89, um, which was an important retrospective in New York, but still didn't have the, gain that traction until um, the turn of the century. And I think it was really also the major turning point, for, unfortunately or fortunately, was um, the birth of Instagram and, um, you know, having her work really be disseminated through these channels um, that she, she was, her Infinity Mirrors, of course, was, you know, she became a household name um, around the time of 2012. You know, I think, uh, as Mika said, that it was a very long journey to become a, a global cultural icon. But I think that happened because she was so ahead of ahead of her time and had all these visionary ideas earlier on. I think she actually paid price for them, and then that was really the almost 20, 30 years that she was kind of forgotten by the international community that um, it's also interesting that, that when she finally triumphantly returned with an exhibition at MoMA in New York, then, then what that exhibition decided to do is to only cover the first 10 years out of the 15 year period. Because the latter five years is when she was doing a lot more scandalous things, you know, like all these performances and, and happenings and starting a fashion business. And these clearly were not serious artist pursuit, um, even at the end of the 60s and early 70s. And I think how she uh, lost the uh, support of critical and art establish establishment in general um, 
was it had a lot to do with the fact that uh, what's happening in culture now, that there is no purity about art world or commercial world. There is ever more conversions or collaborations that are happening now. We're used to that now in the last 20 years or so, but she was doing that 40 years before. And I think that that's what, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, caused her to lose a footing in the New York art world, but the rest of the world came around and caught up with those ideas that, that she had already put forward. And that is exactly why she becomes cultural icon, yes. because she is so expansive and embraces those ideas and the opportunities that those ideas offer. There's another question about the connection to Hong Kong and how does it manifest in her, or does it manifest in her, in her work? And really, one of the earliest conversations I remember us having at the museum here about a Kusama exhibition is the fact that the waxworks in Hong Kong has um, a Kusama, uh, uh, an image of, of Kusama. And it's an extraordinary thing that of all of th that museum, that the only artist is a Kusama image. But at the same time, we know that in Hong Kong, she's never had a, a retrospective here um, of any substance, and the main re relationship with her work is through the through the market, through the auction house. And when talking to the studio, it was very clear that um, Kusama was very very keen to have a major exhibition here because we need to talk about her practice. So the connection in relation to Hong Kong is about saying, this is who I am in my most expansive way. And it's very important because there are so many great collectors of, of Kusama in the region um, to have access to a depth, in-depth um, retrospective so that one understands the oeuvre. Um, so, you know, that is one relationship. Um, I'll move on to another question. Will the two pumpkins designed for Hong Kong M Plus stay here permanently? <laughs> they do look very good, don't they? <laughs> um, we will consider. I also saw another question that said, all of the tote bags have sold out and it's day one. <laughs> I, I, and I know that our retail team are working very hard to replenish. Yes, of course we will replenish. And it, but it goes back to that relationship between um, commerce, the commercial, retail, popular culture, visual culture, and artist. Um, it's a very important relationship. And museum retail, which we um, are very proud of, bringing um, many artists' works through our core collection, collaborating with them on, on um, retail product, we now know that that is an important part of museum work. It offers opportunities for artists to expand, artists and designers uh, to expand um, how they work and think, because it is a relationship now, a museum, between our audiences in many different ways, and it takes many forms. And the creative expression is something we embrace at M Plus as a visual culture institution. Question for Dorian and Mika about the black and white infinity room, the double infinity room. Is there any special meaning and why? It's a, it's a good question. I think that the black and white is very apropos of this moment, um, post -pan or pr pandemic moment. Um, it's the very first that she's done. Usually they're bright colors yellow, red, pink. Um, but at M Plus, we included also the Death of Nerves, which is um, another work that was a trans transcendent, you know, from the earlier piece, the Death of a Nerve, which was black and white. And so the contrast was very important. Um, and having it in that large studio space and, you know, being able to create this, she always sees the infinity mirror rooms as almost like um, interior and exterior, you know, ha like the, your your experience of the body as not being, being inside yourself, but you can't see, you know, outside of it and being immersed in the world. So um, there's a lot of kind of philosophical meaning as well as just simply, you know, um, 
visual experience that is immersive? Um, would Miss Kusama join the exhibition at M Plus sometime later? <laughs> you know, Kusama has been, um, you know, when she checked herself in in 1977 into the sanatorium, she has never left it except for very, very occasional times. It's very rare for her to leave. It's a question of her feeling safe. Um, she is 93. She's not young, and the pandemic times have made it, you know, the, the studio is very protective of her to ensure that she um, doesn't get ill. Um, um, so, but, but it's, you know, one we'll, we will always hope. And I do think that this is an extraordinary exhibition and that she would, she would totally enjoy it. She would love it. We have filmed it for her and the studio will take it back to her. She, she knows exactly where everything went. She worked very closely um, with the curators on the placement of objects and, and why and the discussions around it. So we feel very close to her. Um, but yes, let's see. Another question, at the age of 93 now, how does her recent work differ from those um, in, from the 80s and 90s? That's the force of life. I mean, the very last section of the exhibition called Force of Life includes mostly works from the last 20 years or so. Um, and, and then it's, uh, it's been very interesting to see uh, when I brought some of the people through um, doing the trainings or doing previews. And after going through five different thematic sections covering from, the 19, from 1945 all the way through the 1990s, they come into the final room and everyone just is startled by it, um, by the explosion of colors and forms that um, there are certain echoes of what was there before, but these are completely new forms and palette of colors as well. So for artists who was just entering the eighth decade and ninth decade of her life to almost completely reinvent herself is a truly remarkable thing. And Kusama has always also insisted that any time that there is a survey exhibition, you have to include the latest body of work. Um, so the very last wall that you will see as you are exiting the exhibition is a group of 11 paintings, most of which were painted just this year, just this summer. So we had to reserve one last wall where so that she can show you this is what I did in July, you know? Um, so yeah, I guess the simple answer is that, that the, uh, she just continu continues to innovate. Um, she's not a kind of an artist that, that once I came up with a successful formula and that's where I'm going to rest. That's not Kusama at all. So we have a question here that says, how did the curators decide which works to bring to Hong Kong for this exhibition? It was a long process. Um, four years. We actually started by, I think, researching all of the prior works and works that have been overexposed to, you know, that was also important not to have just the block, the key works that have been shown in a lot of the retrospectives, but works that are um, lesser known. There's actually almost 30 works, historical works that have never been shown outside of Japan, which I think is a real, um, um, a lot of our the, or the research that we did um, shows. And um, then we really came up with these, I think from the body of work as well as the kind of conceptual um, thematics, you know. Um, we began by thinking through both chronologically and thematically and seeing kind of where the intersections, you know, lay and what were the, the strongest works. And of course, along the way, because of the pandemic, there are works that we couldn't get we you know some that we were um, surprised to get you know so we we had a lot of um, selections along the way and then of course the stu the studio had um, some incredible works that um, we included in the last force of life gallery so that was I mean I saw those um, the eleven paintings this summer um, in the studio for the first time which you know was was great to see we didn't know what that wall would be. 
just a couple of questions that I'll, I'll condense around the message of love, but also, um, you know, how, how does that convey in the art, but also the context of Asia um, and her identity as being a Japanese artist. And this is about going back to the philo philosophy. Maybe you can expand that a little bit. Right. So again, uh, one of the purposes or missions that we set for ourselves for this exhibition is to really strike a better balance in narrating her life and career because those 15 years in New York is so um, so glorified. Um, and then that's still the main part of the narrative about her life in various uh, publications and exhibitions that we really felt that it's so important to uh, uh, to highlight the beginning as well as the middle and the late period because I mean in the end the most of her 93 years she has been in Japan um, but other than just being a Japanese or Asian artist ethnically or racially that I think one thing that this exhibition just brings out quite clearly that other exhibitions and publications have not done is that there is a certain very Asian way of thinking, almost religious thinking. That painting that uh, appeared a couple of times in the slides called Transmigration, that was painted in 2011, and this is the sort of neon or acidic green and pink pulsating painting, infinity net painting. Um, painting it in 2011, which is the year of Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and Fukushima disaster, um, utterly traumatic and devastating time for Japan again, and painting that and calling it transmigration, which is the term, Buddhist term, but actually it's more than Buddhist. It's also Hindu term, it's a Vedic term, right, of the how souls travel. Um, so death isn't the end, it is not linear, it's a, death is the beginning of life. Um, so real mourning for the souls of the departed of this, uh, this terrible natural and man-made disaster is one of many examples um, that, she, uh, that you can see the importance of Asian philosophy. I don't think she will identify herself through any particular major religion, um, but that idea of cyclicality is so central in many Asian um, religions. Um, she also, the, especially in biocosmic section, how microcosmos and macrocosmos is the same thing. Just in a seed of a plant is a whole universe, and that the whole universe is just one cell. You know, that is a certainly a very Asian way of thinking. Um. How is Kusama currently? She's actually well at the moment, and is she still working prolifically? Absolutely. And does she check into the psychiatrist, psychiatric hospital every day? She lives in that facility and has since 1977. Um, her emotional ups and downs affect her productivity over the seven days, seven decades. It's absolutely, in fact, the making of her practice is about managing and overcoming um, her, her challenges. It's, a, it's a, a life that we look to, actually, as a way of working through. With her recent uh, My Eternal Soul series, does that mean um, her mental state has become more stable and is, in, is she better psychologically, do you think? I think that the series is a way for her to survive and um, it's the painting is a source of healing for her. So um, in yes, I mean the the paint, the work actually helps her mental state, but her mental state will always, you know, kind of evolve and and sh and of course um, it changes based on um, the weather, the seasons, um, what she's reading, she's very sensitive. So um, it's, you know, I think she still needs to manage it, but it, art is a way for her to confront it too. So that is, um, it's been like that for, since the, since the beginning, not just her recent work. For me, just thinking about her, the, struggles and difficulties or even disorders that, that she has with her mental health, which she herself has been talking about so much for so long. Um, 
are, in a sense, kind of misplaced in a bit. And what I mean by that is it's not to say that there aren't illnesses or ailments or disorders, but that, that I don't think that um, we can apply the normal, typical idea of no, normalcy or normality to Kusama. Um, I think a way to think about it is that she was perhaps destined and born with a certain kind of psychological makeup or mental status, which perhaps is a closer to something like being a medium or being a shaman, you know, that they, you are just on a different plane and that you communicate differently with the spirits and with the rest of the world as well as with yourself, then it's not really, yes, it is not normal because it's not like all of us, typical people, but uh, that doesn't mean that she is uh, abnormal and that her condition has to be once and for all uh, repaired. Question there about, um, you know, she's a very famous Japanese artist. Um, is she respected and popular among the Japanese? Absolutely. Um, very, very much so. And, and the Japanese are very proud of her. And I think the whole artistic world is very proud of her. She's an amazing visionary artist of our time. And, it's, um, and we all embrace that. Um, for the curators, did you learn, discover anything completely new during this process? Through our, you know, it's funny because we put in so much research and effort into conceptualizing this show, and then once we have the works and they go up and we walk through it, there's there's discoveries all the time, like um, the self portrait 1950 um, with the sunflower um, and the pair of lips. I had no idea that that painting actually had the infinity net pa pattern underneath. You know, there's this vortex that surrounds the um, sunflower, and that's 1950. It's a very early, um, and normally we associate the infinity net patterns as like you know from after her years in New York, but that's a revelation. Um, there, I think the these you know ideas of the biocosmic and the radical connectivity, but I think that kind of pairing that um, we. Did we? I didn't really conceive of these. The show as a pairing. It was really these kind of six distinct themes. But as we install the exhibition and see the interconnections of these themes, it really starts to make sense. So, yeah. I mean, his her work to me is always um, there's a lot of discoveries. There's a question about mass production of the pumpkins in factories. Um, it's very important to know that um, Kusama is very, very particular about her IP, her intellectual property. She controls it and she thinks very carefully about how that's expressed. Um, and it's done through very close negotiation and she places um, certain kinds of objects with certain relationships like Louis Vuitton or with a museum shop. But she is very um, interested, I think, in the relationship between math culture and high art. And it is an interesting tension, um, as you, as, as, and it's quite volatile and it's not always settled. There was a question earlier about the value of Kusama's work and how extremely valuable it is, and why is that? That is because people are willing to pay for it. <laughs> That's you know, art. Art is the last really unregulated market, um, and you know, people pay because they want it. The big difference between the market and the museum is that we explore many kinds of value: aesthetic value, historical value the relations, her social relations. The museum is really the spirit house of creativity. And for us, um, financial value is just only one aspect of what we, what we have to engage with, um, where we are interested in something far broader than that. And it's a very important part of the institution's work. 
Um, is there a publication for this show? Yes, there is, and it is actually a very important publication because um, part of putting that publication together was a lot of reading that was done, and we realized that there were very few really definitive publications. Um, I mean, you're, you're the editors. Do you have anything further to say? I mean, I think it's a brilliant publication, and it is published in uh, Chinese and in English. Yes, there are already exhibition catalogs and monographs out there, but again, as we were preparing for this particular publication, we wanted to make sure that it is, uh, that it is definitive um, by treating all different periods and phases of our life and career evenly. Again, there is this tendency of just highlighting a particular moment, and that's not just with Kusama, actually. That happens very often that um, I think the art, art history as well as the museum field tend to privilege a certain breakthrough years. Um, as if then, then, and then artists usually hate that. You know, they want to be seen as they, they are beings that uh, constantly evolve and develop new ideas. They always want to show their latest, just like Kusama, and that we wanted to really respect that as well. But then not just uh, trying to be even or equal or democratic about the, her life and career, but because we really believe that these breakthroughs that she has made, many breakthroughs that, that she has made are always returned to. And there are many recurrences and consistency that happen throughout her career. And, and I think that's what this publication does that others have not done. Um. Maybe one last question. To what degree can her studio represent her in the process? Um, and the, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very important question about how the studio and the artist work together and the long, long relationships that are in place with, with the studio and then how we worked. Well, she has very few members of staff and those few members have worked with her for over 30 years. We had two of them here, um, well, actually five of them, but um, two of them have worked with her for such a long time that they have become, you know, so close to understanding her process. Um, and they also help her fabricate um, her works. She always actually did have people helping her um, because of the vast amount of materials since the 60s, really. Um, but yes, so she's she, the, the trust is very important for Kusama. Um, she doesn't just work with anybody. Um, and our reliance on um, having everything approved, it, it always goes through the same you know, few people. And um, they also check with her. Um, she signs off on everything. She has seen the checklist, the floor plan, the texts that we have written. They've been translated into Japanese in order for her to read them. So um, it's you know it's just it's a very controlled process as much as it is you know a process of how she trusts and trusts you know the staff to really come and realize um, her work, especially the commissions. So with that, I will say good afternoon. I, I urge you to visit the exhibition more than once because it is, there's a lot to see and it is very unique. It's been very finely curated. It is the definitive Kusama show. Um, and we are very proud at M Plus to bring this as part of our first anniversary. So good afternoon and thank you, Dorian Mika. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to this panel. Um, that was a terrific way to wrap up our opening week of Kusama, and I'm really excited for all of you to go and see the show. So if you have tickets to the general admission or to the exhibition, you can exit at the top. If not, head down the stairs, but definitely make sure you come back and visit us. We have a few more programs upcoming to celebrate Kusama. Our next one, our next talk for um, in the next month or so, both 
um, talks focused on our collection. And then in January, we'll bring um, Isabella Tam to talk more about a specific element of Kusama's work. Um, I think it's January 18th, but you'll need to check our website to keep looking for some updates um, on our future talks. So um, yeah, it was lovely having you here. Thank you again, panel. That was fantastic. We always learn something new. Um, and we're really grateful that everyone came out this afternoon to join us.